I thought it might be in my name A shining legacy I thought it might be in a goal For success to follow me I thought it might be in a plan To sail across the sea But I didn't find what I really need I found it all When I lost everything And gave my life To serve a risen King I found the truth That I'd been searching for I found it all when I found the Lord I thought it might be in my way Of how I think my life should be I thought it might be my ideas Of how I dreamed my life could be I'm leaving everything I am right at Jesus' feet For it's here I find everything I need I found it all When I lost everything and gave my life To serve a risen King found the truth that I'd been searching for. I found it all when I found the Lord. I found it all when I lost everything and gave my life to serve a risen and King, I found the truth that I'd been searching for. I found it all when I found the Lord. I found it all when I found the Please take your Bibles out with me this morning. If you would, please find Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5 is where we'll begin this morning. And please, if you would, um, we have been covering some basic discipleship lessons in our 10 o'clock hour. And um, we have covered the first eight lessons in level one. We've completed those, and now we are into level two. This, was, this morning was week number four, and we covered the doctrine of the Christian home uh, this morning. We got about halfway through. Next week, we'll complete that lesson, and uh, we will uh, open our Bibles again at 10 o'clock next Sunday morning to, to look a little bit further into what the Bible says about the family, about the home. And uh, I, I really believe I really believe that the breakdown of the, of the Christian home is to blame for so many of the woes in our country. I, I really believe it. If we would just get back to what the Bible says about our marriages, about our God-given roles in, the, in, in the, the family, about parenting, if we would just get back to what the Bible says. I believe it would make all the difference in the world. And so plan on joining us next Sunday morning at 10 o'clock uh, for that. And uh, we try to go about 45 minutes, and we take a little break, and we have our main service in here. And I'll give you an outline. <clears throat> Everybody that comes gets an outline to take with them. And uh, maybe that'll help you if, as you try to disciple somebody else down the road. Galatians chapter 5 is where I'd like to begin this morning. I would like to read several verses in the, the chapter, uh, but we are going to try to get on down towards the middle or end of the chapter. Galatians chapter 5 this morning. If you brought your Bible with you, would you say amen? amen. Right, what a joy it is to have a copy of God's Word, to be able to read and to study, to be able to have it in our own language. Man, what a, what a tremendous honor that is. But I'll tell you, with that honor comes great responsibility. 
Tremendous responsibility. You and I will never be able to stand before God and say we didn't have any way of knowing. You and I will never be able to say that. He's given it to us in our language for us to read, and let's make the most of it, can we? Galatians chapter 5, look at verse 1. It says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now, if we were to just uh, take a, just a few minutes to, to go back over the, the previous four chapters, we find that by the time we land in chapter 5, we are right on the threshold of, a, of discussing and studying this thing of Christian liberty. Now, there is a Christian liberty movement that is far off base from where it ought to be. Now, you let everybody look at me just for a moment. I am saved. I'm saved from my sin. I am eternally saved. I can never be unsaved. That does not give me license to go out and live however I want. I do have liberty in Christ. I'm not under the bondage of the law any longer, but now I serve a new master. There, there's, there, there's a new service that comes along with this thing. And so the liberty we're reading about here in chapter 5, it's not the message this morning, but the liberty we're reading about in chapter 5 is not the liberty to go do whatever we want without any consequences. If that is your belief about Christian liberty, you have missed what the Bible says. It says, don't be in bondage again. Don't be placed under works for righteousness. Don't be put there. You've been saved, and you have the righteousness of Jesus Christ imputed to you. That's all you need. We're not working to stay saved. We're not trying to keep our salvation. Buddy, it's, it's secure. It, it's already locked up, but never to, be, never to be lost. And so that's not what we're talking about. Look what it says in verse 2. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing, for I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to the whole law. Christ has become of no effect uh, unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. And Paul is saying that to anyone out there who's looking to the Old Testament law, he, he mentions the, the Old Testament Jewish law of circumcision, but he's alluding to the whole law. He says it's not good enough if you just keep the one part about circumcision. If you do that, then now you're, you're a debtor to the whole law. He said, you can't keep it. Don't let anyone put you back under bondage to it. You've been saved. That's what he says. Look at verse 6. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith, which worketh by love. I hope you understand that if you're saved, you're saved by faith. It's by faith. Look at verse 7. Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? You know, I, I hope it can never be said about me or any of my loved ones or anyone in this church. I hope no one ever has to stand back and say, there was a time when you ran well. There was a time where you, you lived your life in accordance with God's word. I hope it's never true in any of our lives where we have to look on those days of obedience to God as a thing of the past. I hope that we can finish like Paul said he finished, having run his course, finished his race, fought a good fight. That's how I want to finish. I don't want to, I don't want to reach a point in my life someday where I have to look back and say, I remember when I lived for God. I remember when I did right. I, I just don't want that in my life. Look what it says in verse 8. This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. I have confidence in you through the Lord that ye will be none otherwise minded, but, that, uh, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment whosoever he be. And in verse 11 is what I'd like to look at this morning. It says in verse 11, I, And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? What a, what a good question for a preacher to ask. He, he, he basically says to the church, if I, if I begin to preach works for salvation, here's what we mean by that. Maybe you're here this morning and you're not familiar with the church lingo. Here's what the Bible means. The Apostle Paul is writing to this church in Galatia, and he says, if I were to preach a works-based salvation, if I were to tell people, just be a good person and you can be saved from your sin, he's saying that if he were to do that, he wouldn't suffer persecution from anyone. Man, people would love that. 
If I were able to walk up to Brother James and say, Brother James, I got good news. Just do the best you can. Be a good neighbor, be a good friend, be a good husband, and God will understand the rest. He'll, he'll save you anyway. James wouldn't hate me. Man, we'd walk away and James would be like, hey, I do have some hope in myself. The Apostle Paul says, that's not the way this thing goes. The Apostle Paul says, I'm not persecuted because I'm preaching works. I'm not hounded and hunted because I'm preaching the Old Testament law. Look what he says. Why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. Here, here's, here's what he says. He says, we are persecuted because instead of preaching the goodness of man, we preach only the goodness of God. And that is offensive to people. People don't like to hear about how good and holy and righteous God is. Now, you're sitting there, and you may be thinking to yourself, what's so bad about that? I don't have a problem with that. The problem is when you acknowledge the, the, the perfection of God, you must also acknowledge that compared to him, you are far from perfect. You cannot have the righteousness of God, the perfection, the perfect holiness of God, and your self-righteousness. Your self-righteousness, and that those, those righteous works, the Bible says they're as filthy rags, and the reason they're as filthy rags is because of the righteousness of God. My filthy rags might look pretty good compared to your filthy rags. In fact, my filthy rags might not even look like filthy rags compared to some. But the moment I step into the presence of the righteousness of God, I begin to blush at the filthiness of my rags of righteousness. The Apostle Paul says, if I wanted to get out from underneath the offense of my preaching, I would just begin to preach the righteousness of man. He says, then would the offense of the cross cease. We can't, we can't do that, though, church. No preacher that has ever preached the goodness of man alone that preacher has never been able to point to one soul in his ministry who was truly saved by believing his message. The Apostle Paul, the man who was shipwrecked, scourged, stoned, left for dead, rejected at one point by all men, he says. That man says, the offense of the cross is worth all the persecution. He said, it's worth it to see people saved. So at Faith Baptist Church, you probably have a, a King James Bible in your lap. We've gathered together at a Bible-believing church. So let's, as Bible-believing Christians, let's discuss the topic this morning about why the cross is offensive. Because no doubt some of you, in fact, I know that some of you, as I've talked with, with you, you, you've come to me and said, here's what I was told. Some of you have been told by coworkers or by family that they will never have any part of your church or your religion because of, of how judgmental and, and divisive and hateful it is. What they're saying is, what we believe offends them. It's nothing new, friend. It's nothing new. Let me remind you that the source of our salvation became the source of our salvation because he offended people to the point they nailed him to a cross. So let's look at three or four things very quickly. Three or four or maybe 10 or 12 things real quick. Reasons why the cross is offensive. Number one, the cross is offensive because it declares our depraved condition. It declares our depraved condition. There was a there was a, an interview done by police officers in an interrogation room. This interview was with a prisoner. It was what you would call a lifetime offender. He had spent most of his life in prison, doing hard time in a, in a federal facility of some sort. And he was in his mid-40s, and he's sitting in the interrogation room. The video comes on, and, a, and a, a detective comes in and sits in the chair across from the guy. And he says, now, I'd like you to just begin at the beginning, and I want you to tell me exactly what happened. 
And he says, well, from, from day one, the guy just kept running his mouth. And at this point, you need to know a little bit of background. He's talking about his cellmate. Now, this is a man, this is a man who was locked up for doing some, some violent and hateful crimes, things that I won't even mention in here because of the, some of the young ears that are in here. None of us would want to be in a room alone with this man. But he's being interrogated because he murdered his cellmate. The cellmate was a pedophile who had, who had abused several young girls. He was convicted, and there were some other charges, but he was in this facility for that crime, so he was put in the cell. And the guy began to tell his, 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 his cellmate about all of his crimes. So this guy looks the detective in the eye and says, this guy was horrible, doesn't deserve to live. <laughs> it, it's not funny, but it is when you consider the man saying this. He was as guilty of breaking the law as the man he killed. His crimes were as many and varied, if not more, than the man he killed. And yet he's telling the detective, he was telling me all he did, and I couldn't take it anymore. I can't stand that kind of person. He didn't deserve to live. So I strangled him with his own shoelaces. Preacher, why in the world did you bring that up? Here's why I bring that up. If you're going to preach the cross of Jesus Christ, as I've already alluded to it, it's going to be offensive because it declares the depravity of man. Remove the cross of Jesus from the the equation, and there is nothing to show our true colors. Because all we have to compare ourselves to is each other. And we will find ourselves slipping into the mentality of that prisoner who says, well, compared to him, I'm, I'm, I'm quite righteous. It makes no sense. God has the perfect perspective. God is not simply righteous. He is the standard by which all righteousness is compared. The cross is offensive because it declares man's depravity. It declares that we are a depraved race of people. Depraved race. Man is capable of doing things to others that baffle the mind, unless you think that you're not capable of doing those things. Friend, the Bible says, let no man think more highly of himself than he ought. You better be careful what you say. There's been a lot of well-meaning people who've had to say, I never thought I'd be where I am today. I never thought I'd be here. The cross of Jesus Christ declares the depravity of man. That's offensive to this world. It's offensive. People don't like to think about how depraved they are. The Bible says in Romans 3.10, you know the verse, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. The world will love you until you start telling them how bad they are. The world will be a friend with you until you start telling them how bad they are compared to a holy God. The cross of Jesus, when we see Jesus Christ dying on Calvary as the perfect Lamb of God, it declares man's depravity. Secondly, the cross is offensive because the cross declares the distressing inability of man. It de- it de- hey, the cross declares our depravity, but then it declares, it also declares and shows how just unable we are to change our position. You know, when Jesus Christ was on the earth and he was preaching, he was constantly being bombarded by Pharisees trying to hold him, hold him to take him to task on the law. They're trying to trap him, trying to find where he had broken the law, trying to find where he had violated that which was right. And over and over and over again, Jesus would just turn their questions back on them. Remember the woman taken in adultery, thrown at Jesus' feet in that dusty ground? Pharisee said, okay, now what are you going to do? Our law says she's worthy of death. What do you say? But Jesus knelt down and doodled on the ground with his finger in the dust. He got back up and he said, let him that is without sin cast the first stone. Jesus said, yeah, you're right. That's what the law says. So let's get this started. Let's start with a person who's never sinned. Let them throw the first one. You know what Jesus did? He turned it back on them, showing them their depravity, but also showing them their inability. 
No one there was righteous. No one there was sinless because they were unable to be so. We see the cross of Calvary. We recognize that Jesus Christ was put there because of our inability to be good. Our inability to pay for our sins. Our inability to be sinless. That's offensive to people. I'll tell you why that's offensive is because people will struggle their entire life to be good enough. They'll go to church. They'll put money in the offering plate. They'll, they'll be that kind neighbor, always looking out for others, always willing to give away the shirt off their back. They'll do their entire life to be good. You try to look a 70-year-old man in the eye who's lived his whole life doing good for others and say, you're not good enough and you never will be. That's offensive. And the cross is offensive for that reason. The cross is offensive because it declares our depravity. It's, it's offensive because it declares our inability. Thirdly, the cross is offensive uh, because it declares our dreadful future. It declares our dreadful future. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Jesus Christ came to taste death for every man. He came, he was nailed to the cross because of sin. And those who reject what he did will suffer for their sin for eternity. People don't like to think about that. That's offensive to people. In John chapter 3, verse 18, it says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That's offensive to people. Isn't this an uplifting message? Don't you have that warm, fuzzy feeling right now? Just, it gets better, I promise. The cross is offensive because it declares our, uh, our definite solution. And that is Jesus Christ, the offering for sin. I, tell you, I told you it gets better because uh, offense is not always a bad thing. You understand this. I was offended as a seven-year-old boy when my mom told me that I was a sinner and the punishment of sin is death. As a seven-year-old boy, that offended my senses. I did not like that. It was revolting to me. It was terrifying to me. My mom had offended me. And yet, had she never offended me, I would have never changed. You understand that debate, argument, it is somebody trying to change somebody else's mind about something. And the only way someone's mind, listen, I hate needless argument and debate. I reach a point with some people where I just say, we're done. You're not, you're not wanting to see anything. You've not presented any evidence. I've given you Bible. I, I, you're not wanting to see. It. This is just vain conversation. We're, we're done. But when someone hears something that is true and it corrects what they believe which is untrue, it offends them, and instead of rejecting it and saying, well, I'm fed up with this. I don't have to listen to this. You're just mean people. Instead, they say, if there's something to this, I'm in trouble. If it's true that I am depraved to the point that I, I, there's no good thing in me, and if it's true that I have no ability in myself to become good, and if it's true that Jesus Christ died on the cross to save me, and there is no other way, if that's true, then I've got a choice to make. Either I'll continue to try to build my own righteousness, which will never happen, or I'll turn to the only source of hope there is. That is Jesus Christ. See, the offense is necessary in order for there to be conversion. Every single person in this place who says they're saved is saved because somewhere along the line, something in the Word of God offended you. But you responded differently than so many people. There's several other points we could see here, but I think we'll end with this thought. 
Some of you have been in church a long time. And then some of you may be here for the very first time. I'm telling you across the board, regardless of your background, you're a human being which tells me you are a sinner. That's what we are, sinners. You might say, say, well, I'm not that bad a person. I'm not that bad a sinner. It doesn't matter. You are a sinner. The sooner you accept that, the sooner you get past that offensive thought, the, the closer you are to the remedy. You must first acknowledge that you are a sinner. And instantly the cross has offended. Secondly, you must accept the fact that sitting in a church house does nothing to save you. You must must come to the realization that it might make you a good person in my eyes, but it does nothing to undo the sin that's already been committed. You must accept that. Thirdly, you must accept that God, knowing your depraved and weak condition, loved you anyway. The Bible says while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. He loved you anyway. And so he set about salvation's plan. The Bible says before the foundation of the world. He said, I will make a way when there is no other way for these people to be saved. For you to reject that way is for you to reject the only hope you have of redemption from your sin. You say things like that, and people get offended. Say things like, I just gave you the greatest, the greatest news anyone's ever given you. But what will you do with it? Jesus asked his disciples when everyone was leaving and running scared, he said, will you also go away? Will you also be offended and, and run away? So I ask you this morning, what will you do? Will you be offended? Well, you say, well, that's just old-fashioned religion. That's offensive. No one believes that anymore. Are you going to be offended and change? Or are you going to be offended and just reject it? What will you do? What will you do? From the youngest child in this place to the oldest adult, the remedy is the same. It's Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ. When are you going to abandon your filthy rags of good works? and instead be clothed in his righteousness. Would you stand with me, please? The Bible says the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. So maybe you've heard what I've said this morning and you're, you, just, you just look at me as though I'm some fool. Some fool who would believe a fairy tale. That's fine. But you cannot dispute the fact that you are a sinner. By God's standard, you are a sinner. Your sin will be paid for one day. Either you'll pay for it through eternity in hell or you'll accept the payment of Jesus Christ on Calvary. There is no other way. Would you bow your heads with me, please? I know that in a Sunday morning crowd, the vast majority of you folks would say, I'm saved. In fact, if you know you're saved, about raising your hand? Let me see your hand. You say, I know I'm saved, preacher. That's wonderful. Thank you. You can put those hands down. Hey, kids, listen to me. Adults, listen to me. Jesus Christ is the only hope you have. If you could not raise your hand just now and know for sure that you've asked Jesus Christ to save you, if you don't know for sure, if you don't remember the time you got saved from your sins by trusting Jesus, then this morning, this is your opportunity. God does not owe you an opportunity, but he's been gracious enough to allow you to hear this offensive message of hope. What will you do with it? I wonder if you'd let me pray for you. I know lots of people just raised their hand saying they were saved. How about, how about let me pray for you? If you'd say, Pastor, I'm not sure that I am saved. 
I'm really not sure, so please pray for me. Would you raise your hand? Let me see your hand very quickly. Thank you, I see that hand. Thank you. You can put it down. Anybody else, preacher, pray for me. I'm, I'm really not sure that I'm saved. Please pray for me, preacher. Anybody else? In just a moment, we're going to have what we call an invitation. At Faith Baptist Church, we invite people to respond to whatever God may have done in their heart this morning. There'll be people that come to the altar to pray for loved ones and pray for different needs. You're welcome to join them. If I were to see you coming down the aisle, I would take my Bible and I will show you how you can be saved if you'd let me. Lord, please take the very, very simple thought this morning. and God, thank you for the day that my sensibilities, my, my conscience was offended by my sin. Thank you for the day that I was offended to the point of repentance. Now, Lord, you've seen this one hand. Maybe there were others. I don't know. And God, whatever the need may be in that life, if they've not, if they've not been saved, then God, please save them. And then, Father, in a crowd this size, the needs are, are many. Lord, there are people who are, are battling illness, and God, they have, many have family trouble, and Lord, all, all different sorts of needs. Lord, you please minister to them. Have your perfect will in this invitation. For it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Would